domain. The Money Moon, a Romance, by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 7, which concerns itself, among other matters, with the old Adam. Bellew awakened early next morning, which was an unusual thing for Bellow to do under ordinary circumstances, since he was one who held with that poet who has written, somewhere or other, something to the following effect. God bless the man who first discovered sleep, but damn the man with curses loud and deep, who first invented early rising. Nevertheless, Bellew, as has been said, awoke early next morning to find the sun pouring in at his window and making a glory all about him. But it was not this that had aroused him. He thought as he lay blinking drowsily, nor the blackbird piping so wonderfully in the apple-tree outside, a very inquisitive apple-tree that had writhed and contorted itself most unnaturally in its efforts to peep in at the window. Therefore Bellew fell to wondering, sleepily enough, what it could have been. Presently it came again, the sound, a very peculiar sound, the like of which Bellew had never heard before, which, as he listened, gradually evolved itself into a kind of monotonous chant, intoned by a voice deep and harsh, yet withal not unmusical. Now the words of the chant were these. When I am dead, diddle-diddle, as well may hap, Bury me deep, diddle-diddle, under the tap. Under the tap, diddle-diddle, I'll tell you why, That I may drink, diddle-diddle, when I am dry. Hereupon Bellew rose, and, crossing to the open casement, Leaned out into the golden freshness of the morning. Looking about, he presently espied the singer, one who carried two pails suspended from a yoke upon his shoulders, a very square man, that is to say, square of shoulder, square of head, and square of jaw, being, in fact, none other than the wagoner with whom he had fought and ridden on the previous afternoon. Seeing which, Bellew hailed him in cheery greeting. The man glanced up, and, breaking off his song in the middle of a note, stood gazing at Bellew open-mouthed. "'What? Be that you, sir?' he inquired, at last, and then, "'Lord, and what be you a-doing up there?' "'Why, sleeping, of course,' answered Bellew. "'What? Again?' exclaimed the wagoner with a grin. "'You do be forever a-sleepin', I do believe.' "'Not when you're anywhere about,' laughed Bellew. "'Was it me as woke ye, then?' your singing did. My singing! Lord love ye, and well it might. My singing would wake the dead. Leastways, so Prudence says, and she's generally right. Leastways, if she ain't, she's an uncommon good cook, and that goes a long way with most of us. But I don't sing very often unless I be alone, or easy in my mind and happy hearted, which I ain't. No, inquired Bellew, not by no matter of means I ain't. "'Contrary-wise, my art be sore and full of gloom, which ain't to be wondered at, nohow. "'And yet you were singing.' "'Eh, for sure I were singing. "'But then who could help singing on such a morning as this be, "'and with a blackbird a-piping away in the tree here? "'Oh, I were singing. "'I don't go for to deny it, but it's sore-hearted I be, "'and filled with gloom, sir, notwithstanding.' "'You mean,' said Bellew, becoming suddenly thoughtful, that you are haunted by the carking spectre of the, er, uh, might have been? <laughs> Lord bless you, no, sir. This ain't no spectre, nor yet no skellington, which, arter all, is only old bones and such. No, this ain't nothing of that sort, and no more it ain't a thing I can stand here a maggin about with a long day's work before me. Axing your pardon, sir. Saying which, the wagoner nodded suddenly, and strode off with his pails clanking cheerily. Very soon Bellew was shaved, and dressed, and going downstairs, he let himself out into the early sunshine, and strolled away towards the farmyard, where cocks crew, cows lowed, ducks quacked, turkeys and geese gobbled and hissed, and where the wagoner moved to and fro among them all, like a presiding genius. "'I think,' 
said Bellow, as he came up, I think you must be the Adam I have heard of. That be my name, sir. Then, Adam, fill your pipe. And Bellow extended his pouch, whereupon Adam thanked him, and, fishing a small, short, black clay from his pocket, proceeded to fill and light it. Yes, sir, he nodded, inhaling the tobacco with much apparent enjoyment. Adam, I were baptized some thirty-odd years ago, but I generally calls myself Old Adam. But you're not old, Adam. Why, it ain't on account of my age, you see, sir. It be all because of the old Adam as is inside of me. <laughs> Lord love ya! I am naturally that fool of the old Adam as never was, and he's always a up and taken of me at the shortest notice. Only t'other day he up and took me because of Job Jagway. He works for Squire Cassilis, you'll understand, sir, because Job Jagway says is our wheat, meaning Miss Anthea's wheat, you'll understand, sir, was mouldy. Well, the old Adam up and took me to that extent, sir, that they had to carry Job Jagway home afterwards, which is all on account of the old Adam. Me being the mildest chap you ever see, naturally. Mild? Ah, sucking doves wouldn't be nothing to me for mildness. And what did the squire have to say about your spoiling his man? Wrote to Miss Anthea, of course, sir. He's always writing to Miss Anthea about something or other. Says as how he was minded to lock me up for salt and battery, but out of respect for her would let me off with a warning. Miss Anthea was worried, I suppose. Worried, sir? Oh, Adam, says she. Oh, Adam, haven't I got enough to bear, but you must make it harder for me? And I see the tears in her eyes while she said it. Me make it harder for her? Just as if I wouldn't make things lighter for her if I could which I can't, just as if, to help Miss Anthea, I wouldn't let him take me, and, well, never mind what. Only I would. Yes, I'm sure you would, nodded Bellew. And is the squire over here at Dapplemere very often, Adam? Why, not so much lately, sir. Last time were yesterday, just before Master Georgie come home. I were at work here in the yard, and squire comes riding up to me, smiling quite friendly-like which were pretty good of him, considering as Job Jackway ain't back to work yet. "'Oh, Adam,' says he, "'so you're avin' a sail here at Dapplemere, are ye?' Meaning, sir, a sail of some bits and sticks of furniture, as Miss Anthea's forced to part with to meet some bill or other. "'Summat o' that, sir,' says I, making as light of it as I could. "'Why, then, Adam,' says he, "'if Job Jagway should happen to come over to buy a few of the things—' "'No more fighting,' says he. "'And so he nods and smiles, and off he rides. "'And, sir, as I watched him go, "'the old Adam riz up at me to that extent "'as it's a mercy I didn't have no pitchfork handy.' "'Bellew, sitting on the shaft of a cart "'with his back against a rick, "'listened to this narration with an air of dreamy abstraction. "'But Adam's quick eyes noticed that "'despite the unruffled serenity of his brow— his chin seemed rather more prominent than usual. So that was why you were feeling gloomy, was it, Adam? Ah, and enough to make any man feel gloomy, I should think. Miss Anthea is brave enough, but I reckon twill come nigh breaking her heart to see the old stuff sold, the furniture and that. So she's going to drive over to Cranbrook to be out of the way while it's a doin'. And when does this sale take place? "'The Saturday after next, sir, as ever was,' Adam answered. "'But, hush, mum's the word, sir.' He broke off, and, winking violently with a sideways motion of the head, he took up his pitchfork. Wherefore, glancing round, Bellew saw Aunt Thea coming towards them, fresh and sweet as the morning. Her hands were full of flowers, and she carried her sunbonnet upon her arm. Here and there a rebellious curl had escaped from its fastenings as though desirous, and very naturally, of kissing the soft oval of her cheek, or the white curve of her neck. And among them Bellew noticed one in particular, a roguish curl that glowed in the sun with coppery light, and peeped at him wantingly above her ear. "'Good morning,' said he, rising and to all appearance, addressing the curl in question. 
"'You are early abroad this morning.' "'Early, Mr. Bellew? Why, I've been up hours. I'm generally out at four o'clock on market days. We work hard and long at Dapplemere,' she answered, giving him her hand with her grave, sweet smile. "'Aye, for sure,' nodded Adam. "'But farming ain't what it was in my young days.' "'But I think we shall do well with the hops, Adam.' "'Ops, Miss Anthea? Lord love you! There ain't no ops nowhere so good as ourn be.' "'They ought to be ready for picking soon. Do you think sixty people will be enough?' "'Ah, there'll be more than enough, Miss Anthea.' "'And, Adam, the five-acre field should be mowed to-day.' "'I'll set the men at it right after breakfast. I'll have it done, trust me, Miss Anthea.' "'I do, Adam. You know that.' And with a smiling nod she turned away. Now, as Bellew walked on beside her, he felt a strange constraint upon him such as he had never experienced towards any woman before, and the which he was at great pains with himself to account for. Indeed, so rapt was he that he started suddenly to find that she was asking him a question. "'Do you like Dapplemere, Mr. Bellew?' "'Like it?' he repeated. "'Like it? Yes, indeed.' "'I'm so glad,' she answered, her eyes glowing with pleasure. "'It was a much larger property once. Look!' And she pointed away across cornfields and rolling meadow to the distant woods. "'In my grandfather's time it was all his, as far as you can see and farther. But it has dwindled since then, and to-day my Dapplemere is very small indeed.' "'You must be very fond of such a beautiful place.' "'Oh, I love it,' she cried passionately. "'If ever I had to give it up, I, I think I should die.' She stopped suddenly, and as though somewhat abashed by this sudden outburst, adding in a lighter tone, "'If I seem rather tragic, it's because this is the only home I have ever known.' "'Well,' said Baloo, appearing rather more dreamy than usual just then, I have journeyed here and there in this world of ours. I have wandered up and down and to and fro in it, like a certain celebrated personage who shall be nameless. Yet I never saw or dreamed of any such place as this Dapplemere of yours. It is like Arcadia itself, only I am out of place. I seem somehow to be too commonplace, and altogether matter-of-fact." <laughs> "'I'm sure I'm matter-of-fact enough,' she said with her low, sweet laugh that Bellew thought was all too rare. "'You?' said he, and shook his head. "'Well,' she inquired, glancing at him through her wind-tossed curls, "'you are like some fair and stately lady out of the old romances,' he said gravely. "'In a print gown and with a sunbonnet.' "'Even so,' he nodded. Here, for no apparent reason, happening to meet his glance, the color deepened in her cheek, and she was silent. Wherefore, Bella went on, in his slow, placid tones, "'You, surely, are the princess ruling this fair land of Arcadia, and I am the stranger within your gates. It behooves you, therefore, to be merciful to this stranger, if only for the sake of, uh, our mutual nephew. Whatever Anthea might have said in answer was cut short by small Porges himself, who came galloping towards them with the sun bright in his curls. "'Oh, Uncle Porges!' he panted as he came up. "'I, I was afraid you'd gone away and left me. I've been hunting and hunting for you ever since I got up.' "'No, I haven't gone away yet, my Porges, you see.' "'And you won't go, ever or ever, will you?' That, said Bellew, taking the small hand in his, that is a question that we had better leave to the, um, future, nephew. But why? Well, you see, it doesn't rest with me, altogether, my Porges. Then who? He was beginning, but Anthea's soft voice interrupted him. Georgie, dear, didn't Prudence send you to tell us that breakfast was ready? "'Oh, yes! I was forgetting! Awful silly of me, wasn't it? But you are going to stay, 
Oh, a long, long time, aren't you, Uncle Porges? I certainly hope so, answered Bellew. Now, as he spoke, his eyes, by the merest chance in the world, of course, happened to meet Anthea's. Whereupon she turned and slipped on her sunbonnet, which was very natural, for the sun was growing hot already. "'I'm awful glad,' sighed Small Porges. "'And Auntie's glad, too, aren't you, Auntie?' "'Why, of course,' from the depths of the sunbonnet. "'Cause now, you see, there'll be two of us to take care of you. Uncle Porges is so nice and big and, and wide, isn't he, Auntie?' "'Yes. Oh, Georgie!' "'What are you talking about? "'Why, I mean, I'm rather small to take care of you all by myself alone, Auntie, "'though I do my best, of course. "'But now that I've found myself a big, tall Uncle Porges, under the hedge, you know, "'we can take care of you together, can't we, Auntie Anthea?' "'But Anthea only hurried on without speaking, "'whereupon small Porges continued all unheeding. "'You remember the other night, Auntie?' "'When you were crying, and you said you wished you had someone very big and strong to take care of you?' "'Oh, Georgie!' Bellew heartily wished the sunbonnets had never been thought of. "'But you did, you know, Auntie, and so that was why I went on and found my Uncle Porges for you, so that he—' But here Mistress Anthea, for all her pride and stateliness, catching her gown about her, fairly ran on down the path, and never paused until she had reached the cool, dim parlour. Being there, she tossed aside her sunbonnet, and looked at herself in the long, old mirror, and, though surely no mirror made by man ever reflected a fairer vision of dark-eyed witchery and loveliness, nevertheless Anthea stamped her foot and frowned at it. "'Oh!' she exclaimed, and then again, "'Oh, Georgie!' and covered her burning cheeks. Meanwhile Big Porges and Small Porges, walking along hand in hand, shook their heads solemnly, wondering much upon the capriciousness of aunts, and the waywardness thereof. "'I wonder why she runned away, Uncle Porges.' "'Ah, I wonder. I expect she's a bit angry with me, you know, cause I told you she was crying.' "'Hum,' said Bellew. <sighs> "'And Auntie takes an awful lot of looking after,' sighed Small Porges. "'Yes,' nodded Bellow. "'I suppose so. "'Especially if she happens to be young and, um, "'And what, Uncle Porges?' "'Beautiful, nephew.' "'Oh, do you think she's really beautiful?' demanded Small Porges. <laughs> "'I'm afraid I do,' Bellow confessed. "'So does Mr. Cassilis. I heard him tell her so once, in the orchard. Hum, huh, said Bellew. Ah, but you ought to see her when she comes to tuck me up at night, with her hair all down and hanging all about her, like a shiny cloak, you know. Hum, said Bellew. Please, Uncle Porges, said Georgie, turning to look up at him. What makes you hum so much this morning? I was thinking, my Porges, about my auntie Anthea? I do admit the soft impeachment, sir. Well, I'm thinking, too. What is it, old chap? I'm thinking we ought to begin to find that fortune for her after breakfast. Why, it isn't quite the right season for fortune hunting yet, at least not in Arcadia, answered Bellew, shaking his head. Oh, but why not? Well, the moon isn't right for one thing. The moon? echoed Small Porges. Oh, yes, we must wait for a, er, a money moon, you know. Surely you've heard of a money moon? Afraid not, sighed Small Porges regretfully. But I've heard of a honeymoon. Oh, they're often much the same, nodded Bellew. But then when will the money moon come, and, and how? I can't exactly say, my Porges, but Come at will one of these fine nights, and when it does, we shall know that the fortune is close by and waiting to be found. So don't worry your small head about it, just keep your eye on your uncle. Betimes they came in to breakfast, where Aunt Thea awaited them at the head of the table. Then, who so demure, so gracious, and 
self-possessed, so sweetly sedate is she. But the cavalier in the picture above the carved mantel, versed in the ways of the world and the pretty tricks and wiles of the beau sex feminine, smiled down at Bellow with an expression of such roguish waggery as said plain as words, We know. And Bellew, remembering a certain pair of slender ankles that had revealed themselves in their hurried flight, smiled back at the cavalier, and it was all he could do to refrain from winking outright. End of chapter 7